Muchas gracias. Les recordamos a nuestros invitados que si desean hacer uso del servicio de traducción, en la parte de atrás, nuestras compañeras, por favor, si son tan amables, regresamos a nuestros lugares. La doctora Diane Davis es maestra y doctora en Sociología por la Universidad de California en Los Ángeles. Fue nombrada jefa del Departamento de Diseño y Planeación Urbana de la Escuela de Diseño de Harvard, donde también es profesora de Planeación Regional y Urbanismo. Su línea de investigación se enfoca principalmente en la transformación de las ciudades del sur, centrándose en los conflictos urbanos, sociales, espaciales y políticos que han surgido a consecuencia de la globalización. Actualmente dirige un proyecto de la Fundación de Educación e Investigación Volvo llamado Transformando el Transporte Urbano, el rol del liderazgo político. También es investigadora de un proyecto sobre el desarrollo urbano sostenible y vivienda en México, financiado por el Infonavit. Cedemos la palabra a la doctora Dayan Davis con su conferencia El reto de la verticalidad y la redensificación. Le solicito un fuerte aplauso para recibirla. They saw it was a crisis, 
but they were really looking for help and assistance, recommendations about what ways they should be, what new paths they should be following in the context of their efforts to try to jumpstart densification. Densification was a key issue for Infonavit because it became clear if you looked at the data across the nation where the most uh, abandoned housing tended to be located was in the far periphery of the city, in large, massive developments far away from transport, from work, from family members, extended family members, etc. In the context of these problems, Infonavit introduced new policies at the national level that included focusing on changing the subsidy structure to incentivize housing production in denser areas. And we were charged with thinking about how successful have those policies been with respect to changing the so-called terrain of housing or changing the way that housing was being produced in Mexico. So we wanted to know whether the new national policies were working. We wanted to be able to look at what was working and what wasn't working and to be able to think about what strategies could be applied to better coordinate the different levels of government in order to produce more dense social housing. So Infonavit had a, had a challenge. They could introduce new legislation and new subsidy structures about prioritizing denser and more vertical social housing production. But they really were hamstrung with respect to talking to all the other sets of institutional actors from the municipality to the state to other federal agencies, agencies like the Secretary of Environmental Development or even this CONAMI. So there were a variety of actors that all in some ways had an interest and a desire and a little bit of an impact on housing development, but none of those people were talking to each other. So a second question that we had, not just are the new policies working, but how can we make sure that there was better coordination across agencies horizontally and vertically in Mexico to ensure that dead social housing was actually being incentivized and produced. That entailed, of course, asking questions about the regulatory and technical tools or urban planning interventions, and which ones seemed to be improving the, the densification record at the level of the city. And we also wanted to ask questions about which levels of government would have to be involved in this conversation. As everybody in this room knows, the decision about permits for housing lays in the hands of the, municipal, the municipality. But it was we started our research with the important question about what were the problems associated with having permitting decision making at one particular scale, at one level, when you think about money and financing as well as as other ways that are, other, other forms of programs that are needed in order to create better quality of life through housing, we're not making decisions at the level of the municipality. I wanted to say quickly, and I'm gonna, I am gonna go through this quickly because you all know this, but the context, the, the, there were the four ways that we situated our research in the context of of how Infonavit saw itself acting and the problems Infonavit was concerned with. First of all, as I mentioned, it, well, the four problems are the commitment to densification, which I mentioned. The second, financial sustainability of Infonavit as an agency. Third, the macroeconomic context of Mexico. And fourth, the on-the-ground realities of interagency coordination. So, as I just mentioned, Infonavit was heavily committed to densification. They understood the problem, problems of abandoned housing as well as low quality work had a lot to do with where new houses were being developed out in peripheral areas where municipal authorities were very eager to give permits without all the necessary requirements in order to make the housing, whether it's water, infrastructure, etc. Um, but also, in particular, the introduction of the Perimetro de Potencia Urbana. Again, as I mentioned earlier, a new program, subsidy program, that, uh, well, housing experts are in here, there are three zones, U1, U2, U3, where the subsidy that Infonavit would give to build housing was greater in the number in the zone one as opposed to zone two and zone three. 
But in the context of this um, initiative, Infonavi had to worry about its own fiscal budget. And it was paying for money, it was spending money paying for new programs to deal with abandoned housing on one hand. But on the other hand, there was demand for still continuing to build new housing on the other. Credits every year, it's a, it's a response to demands of, of the public in, the, in Mexico, but also the commitment to continually build housing. There's still a demand for housing um, in many parts of Mexico. But on the other hand, it had to think about building new housing while it was spending money paying for the problems of old housing that had been abandoned. On top of this, having to deal with new incentives about coordination meant developers in, in many of the cities in Mexico were by and large skittish or reluctant to build in the more dense areas because land was more costly, permitting was more difficult, and often in old areas of the city there were not large swaths of land to build housing, and these were the kind. This was the modus operandi of the housing sector. In Fonavit, as an agency which is committed to building housing with workers' own money for themselves, is also, as a federal level agency, is also extremely concerned about macroeconomic sustainability in Mexico as well. And to stop the housing production while it was spending money on fixing up abandoned housing would have implications for the construction industry and for the national economy. Even though, on this, at the same time, building housing on the old model was creating more demands on cities themselves to put in more infrastructure, transportation, water, other services, that make that housing livable. So it was, I, I would say that in Photobeat, as are many, cities and developers was stuck between a rock and a hard place. How do you move forward on all these objectives and not waste your money just to get the number of housing units built? Because getting the number of housing units built will not necessarily enhance densification aims. So again, I just want to remind us that the problem of the macroeconomic context, it was not just a desire to keep the construction and developer industry Moving forward, many developers over the prior 10 to 12 years had bought large land reserves, and there were banks that were going and developers that were going bankrupt. So there was a larger context in which there was pressure on Infonavit at the national scale to keep housing moving because it was a national economic problem. And I think need not remind people here that. The problem of the economy, especially if it's stalled on the upper end with respect to banking and construction and real estate development, which except for here in Guanajuato and the Bajillo, you have an auto industry and you have a strong vibrant economy. But Infonavit as an organization is working for the entire nation, having policies that are being uh, applied across the entire nation in many of the cities Infonavit was working the employment situation was extremely bad. Wages of workers were very low. Sometimes one to two minimum wages does not allow them to buy even the lowest quality housing. And when in a con condition of, an, of economic crisis, when a worker loses his or her job, that will help ripple through the entire housing production uh, chain because houses, they, they stop paying their mortgages, that has implications for the bank. It makes it brings abandoned housing, which brings crime, violence, which costs money to solve. Uh, and the, the last, the last context, you know, these are the dilemmas that we were trying to face were the ones of the fragmented institutional context. There was really no single agency that brought together all the actors, both at the horizontal level of the city, up city to the state, state to the nation. Now, I'm, I'm underscoring these, this kind of research context because I want you to understand that our, we, we, we have two teams at Harvard doing work for Infonavi. One is a team of urban planners that are looking at best practices for densification with housing, which would include uh, location as well as verticality. But 
Our team was a research team about governance and coordination and trying to understand not just what should be done, but what is getting in the way of introducing good policies. In other words, what's really happening on the ground in cities in Mexico that would enable or constrain the achievement of the goals of densification. So what we then, rather than doing literature reviews of like what makes, you know, how do you build vertical housing that's affordable, etc., we went right to the field. We went to seven different cities. This project unfolded over over two and a half summers with students in the field talking to stakeholders in seven different cities. And we were looking for successes and failures of the densification policy. I think we, you'll see from the, this map that the cities we were looking at are all extremely different. And it was important for us to not just go for, not just look at Mexico City or not just look at Guadalajara, some of the big cities with large Monterrey, we also looked at Monterrey as well, but also to try to vary the nature, the economic and the social and the political nature of the cities. And the reason that we wanted to look at variation across cities is because we started with the with the, the thought that that some of the problems of Infonavit's programs and subsidy policies is that they're very very general policies that are made for the entire nation, but every city is different. Not just in terms of their economy and how, let's say, minimum wages, but the physical structures of cities are very different. Cultural practices in cities are different. So that added another leg of our questioning about what's producing success and densification policy. Could, it, could there be one policy that produced success everywhere? Or could it be that the same policy was successful in one city and failed in another city because of local conditions, political, spatial, social, economic? So we went to seven different cities. I do want to say that um, the overall findings, um, one, before I move to my next slide, the first general finding that was obvious to us within the first year of doing the research was changing the and the commitment to densification at the level of the federal government, particularly through the, the polygonos, the contention, the zones that Infonavit had introduced, was just not enough. It was obvious that it, it sent the message that densification was important, but putting on paper and even changing programs with so many levels to, to incentivize densification barely gets you out the door. And that's because how those get negotiated and responded to at the level of the city is entirely different than what Infonavit is thinking at the level of the federal government. Okay, what I want to do here is just very quickly summarize the seven different cities we looked at. What were the barriers to success in densification and what were the enablers? And let me also say that we, in this research, we tried to distinguish between cities that were moving forward on, on housing production with V credits and, and the housing that was also achieving densification aims. And that was an interesting question because in many cities, the there was still building of housing in, in these uh, unsustainable ways. Not every city was responding to the disincentives to build out of the periphery. Um, so we were interested in, in our research, and I won't share them all, but we can make that available to people here if you're interested in that. You will see that, that often the first place, at best, there was more building in the second, in the, in the zone two, we'll go two, one is really hard, three still continued. So in some senses, a success in the city of Mexico was just stopping the percentage of housing growing in U3, so getting to U2. But I think that the other thing that I want to say before we go over the, each of the seven cities is um, that the other general barrier, and you all understand this here, uh, and in some moments it looked like an opportunity, but the general barrier to kind of achieving aims of densification in all the cities, no matter what, and some of these are more successful than others, was basically the housing, the mass production housing model. 
and the idea of number, huge numbers of units being built. Because most of the mass production, production housing needs large swaths of land, which means it is almost, by definition, has to be in U3. Occasionally, U2, there are swaths of land that are available for the negotiation, and that was considered a success. But if there's no way of rethinking the mass housing production model, it's going to be very hard for the new programs and policies and incentives, incentives to change the nature of the city. We have to be thinking the model differently. And I think that in this today's events, we'll, we'll have other people talking about that, but it's important to remember that even, even verticalization, you can have mass production of verticalization, and that can start moving towards densification in a positive way, even if it's in not a very central location. But this idea of single family homes out on large swaths of land in the periphery of the city is absolutely the worst thing for environmental, social, and fiscal sustainability for Infonavit and for any city. And I think you all know that, but the question is, how do you change your direction of building housing? I also think part of the problem there is housing, and we have many experts in here, many of you are in this industry, but even in Infonavit with experts on housing and planning and finances, I also, we also found that the preoccupation in the housing sector with the unit, with the house, and not the city, was the first misstep in responding to densification aims. And what we are going to be, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the places that we're able to move a little beyond just thinking about sheer numbers of houses and thinking about the quality of those houses and where they are. And I think that that requires an entire sea change of thinking. In an industry, and it's not just in Mexico, it's all over the world, when you think about problems of housing, you think about housing, and you think about the unit of housing. One of the reasons I titled my talk, rather than just talking something about virtualization, about building better cities, we are trying to push in Fonavit to think about ways in which it can use housing to build better cities. So we need a mind change. Not building more housing, not building better housing, building better cities, and what role can housing play in building better cities? So, and I'm gonna give you some of our recommendations about how that can happen, but let me just go over the seven cities that we went to. These are actually listed alphabetically. Um, I mean, you can't read them very well, that doesn't come off the LED screen. I'll, I'll say a little something about it. We listed them alphabetically, but I do wanna say that of all the seven cities we looked at, I remember it was Aguas Calientes, Cancun, Guadalajara, Merida, Monterrey, Tijuana, Oaxaca. Aguas Calientes, which I know is a neighbor, um, was amazingly, I would say it was the most successful case that we looked at. Now, this didn't mean that there were barriers to densification in, in Aguas Calientes, the price of land in the center of the city, like every city in Mexico, like every city around the world, is exorbitant, it's high. There were a lack of land reserves in Aguas Calientes, which sometimes can be a good thing, because if you have too many land reserves that have been bought previously, people are, are struggling politically and socially, financially, to make sure they build on those, those land reserves. But so that it could be considered in the neighborhoods where, as well as a barrier, because if you have too much open land, you're not gonna be creative about Using more, more, less occupied land. But Aguas Calientes saw that as a problem for building dense social housing prices as well as the, the lack of land reserves. Guadalajara, 12 in the metropolitan area. We started to see a correlation, not a causality, between the number of municipalities in a metro area and how successful densification efforts were. And one of the reasons for that was because multiple municipalities fragments the political and land sphere. And developers are able to negotiate bargains with other municipalities if the ones that are more central are not willing to let them do whatever they want and they want to impose criteria and densification. Now, I know that you do not have control over the number of municipios in your metropolitan area. Um, I asked last night how many you have here in Leon. 
but this is an important institutional barrier that means that you need some effort of coordination across the municipalities. Aguas Calientes was successful because the municipality, the municipio holds power to give land permits and the municipal and the state will working together with resources and programs. And in places where the state doesn't work well with either a metro agency or a single municipality, you don't get to, you don't get desertification advances. And I would say on the opposite end of our spectrum, we, we discussed among ourselves which was the basket case. We didn't want to really criticize uh, any place in Mexico too much, but Guadalajara is on the other end of the continuum. Extremely fragmented metropolitan area with strong political parties that don't necessarily want to coordinate across the scale of the municipality to think about building a better city through housing. So they just then stay focused on their own municipality. Let me move forward here. Well, that's probably hard to mention well, something about municipal fragmentation. But on the other hand, in place, this doesn't mean that in all these places where there were barriers that there weren't also positive things happening. And I think that's the important lesson here. In particular, in Guadalajara, Cana Devi organized the Mesa de Trabajo, which has been a main actor in many of the cities, and I know here as well, to be able to bring people together to talk to each other. Because if you couldn't bring the politicians at the municipal level to talk across boundaries, you could bring other actors that are willing to talk across boundaries. In the case of Cancun, I think it's interesting for you folks here in uh, Leon to look up more at the case of Cancun because Cancun was an interesting city for us because it is a city that's built around an economy of tourism. So it was very clear that there was one issue that united people, even though there was not as many municipalities in Cancun, that's the first thing to say. There were like three in the metro area, and then because also uh, uh, for historical reasons, it's a, it's a relatively new state in Mexico. But um, there were fewer municipalities, but there also was a common mission in the city to think about tourism and the workers in the tourist industry. And that identity brought together people to make common decisions about housing in ways that you did not see in some of the cities that were more fragmented. Um, quickly, Merida is another place that was interesting to us because Merida is a city that isn't, hasn't been destroyed yet by housing, I don't think. Uh, there is not that much housing development, although now because it's one of the safest cities in Mexico, a lot of people are using their infinity credit to buy second homes in, in Merida, and that is putting pressure on expansion out into the peripheral areas. So Merida is sitting on the crossroads of being able to do something about preventing unsustainable urban growth, but it is constrained in a way by the cultural traditions of the single family with a small yard tradition with a hammock, et cetera. And these actually are very important differences across regions that in Fonami, at the federal level, is not able to think about, but have to be taken into account at the local level. So, so incentives of identification, verticality, and densification in places like Merida are very hard to sell. It's hard to get developers to support them because they say people won't buy those houses. So in a way, they have a different cultural milieu and spatial context where they are trying to make co coordination. Monterrey is, a, is another city like Leon, I think, in terms of the important role of the industrial sector in determining what happens in Monterrey. The problem in Monterrey is that they have a very fragmented set of municipalities as well. So there is absolutely no coordination across the municipalities or the municipios in Monterrey, and as a consequence, they're still building out in the periphery. And I think they're also still building out the periphery because they're still building factories in Monterrey, and the industrial class works very strongly with the, with the CROC and the workers organization to make sure there's housing for workers. And so from there, kind of, if the unit of housing for employers and workers is the defining ethos, you might say Monterrey is successful. But if densification, sustainability, and building better cities is your litmus test, Monterrey is headed towards a disaster as well. I think Leon has an opportunity to change the, change the model. An industrial city that can do something different and be a national leader in Mexico. Tijuana, on the other hand, um, 
is uh, a city with only basically three municipalities and a huge crisis of abandoned housing. So it also, as you all know, is bordered on the United States. So topographical issues make the question of densification an, uh, almost an intellectual debate. Because where do you densify a city that's growing horizontally because it's caught by boundaries, a national border as well as mountains, with the historic city way over by the ocean on the left? So I, I'm raising this in our research because it, it, we also found that how um, stakeholders in different cities defined densification and whether it was appropriate for their city varied across cities. And I think that you should feel free to ask questions about what does densification mean in a city that's already quite sprawled. That should be part of the question. And what is verticality? Does verticality always have to be in a locational center, or could you create more sustainable and better cities with verticality in clustered areas in a physical, in the physical environment? The Infotivate policies were building on kind of geography, central place theory logic, which is U1 is in the center, U2, and U3. But that doesn't, that logic doesn't work in every urban environment. So you have to be able to have that conversation. And the interesting thing about Tijuana is they were able to have the conversation because there was very little resistance to densification because the crisis of abandoned housing was so great that you had public officials, citizens, and, and developers all agreed no more building out in the outskirts. Every building had to be taking advantage of the city. So there were barriers as well as enablers in that case. And the last place we looked at was Oaxaca. Um, and it was actually very instructive for us. We were there with a team of students. It was instructive to think about the barriers and enablers and densification in Oaxaca, because Oaxaca is a really very small city. And there's not a huge number of infantry credits for workers in, in Oaxaca, because a lot of people are artisans and craftspersons and are not not paying into infinity pensions. Um, but also, there, uh, I mean, Oaxaca has a history of self-governance. Usos y costumbres, they have a totally different way of making decisions about permits and land in the metropolitan area. Some municipalities uh, follow the Mexican state national law, and some follow the traditional usos y costumbres. So to have them talking together about how to think about building a more dense and a more sustainable city was very difficult. But let me also say that I didn't see, there were several terrible failures of housing in the periphery, but there wasn't a huge demand for housing. So the kind of opportunity to slowly, in the short term, negotiate a better urban policy and a better urban fabric for Oaxaca is possible, more possible in a place, unlike Leon, that's growing rapidly. So again, all these are different types of conditions that have to factor into the objective of creating greater densification. Oh, sorry, I didn't show my Oaxaca slide up there. Okay, so let me go quickly to the main findings and then our proposal. The main findings, which is kind of obvious, I guess, in the way I've been presenting the material to you, uh, but I do think it was kind of an aha moment in the federal level in Infotivy, is that one size policy does not fit all. You can't accept expect the same agenda and the same policies to work the same way in all the cities. And I say this to you not because that should be a surprise to you, but it means that you should feel empowered to be able to say, this is our city, this is what, these are the barriers to densification, these are the possibilities that might enable a dens densification, and we might have to take a different way of putting together packages and incentives than is already structured within Infonavit. Not because Infonavit is wrong in thinking about federal guidelines, but you cannot possibly think about the same federal guideline that will work the same way in all the cities, and even Fonavit might as well that. On the other hand, as a federal agency, in Fonavit cannot work, make, what, how many states are there, 32? 32 different policies, right, for, for Mexico. So it is up to you at the scale of the, the problem, the city, the metro, and the state to be able to think about that. Of course, the, one of the, major concerns for us was a coordination, really a serious 
coordination at the scale of the metropolitan level, which is what you need to think about building better cities and densification, was practically elusive in every place that we've studied. Even though there are metro agencies that are working, Guadalajara has a very strong and empowered metro agency. Many different, oops, I lost, I lost my slide. Did I get something here? Oh, somebody get me on my main, main finding slide. Oh yeah, okay, great, thank you. Um, you, can, you can create an institution, but whether it's going to work, and whether people are going to participate in it is a different story. Guadalajara has a big metro agency. Many of the cities have metropolitan funds, but they don't have a legitimacy and trust across all the municipalities to work together for the common good. And where coordination was most apparent to us is when the state level got involved in the metro level. Again, that's our discovery in place. The third point, again, the current permit structure and incentives insufficiently advanced dense and sustainable social housing. Keeping the power only in a single municipality to give granting permits without that municipality having to think about the larger metro scale does, is not going to be, is going to be a barrier to thinking more carefully about densification. And I want to say that many of the municipalities we looked at, they all plans and legal mechanisms on the books about densification. But what's written on the paper and what happens in the reality, I need not tell you here, is like there are miles apart. So it's not even just a matter, this is where I depart a bit from my colleagues in urban planning. I think that we have to think about projects and not just like writing laws and plans because plans can be look great on paper, but if they're not followed, if you don't get people to come together around projects, plans are not going to change the fabric of the city. And the last one then is the prioritizing the volume over the quality has been fiscally short-sighted in all of these cities, if not unsustainable. And many cities are unwilling now to kind of put in their own municipal funds onto new housing, dense housing projects or work with developers to do that because they are spending lots of money on services, transportation, water, electricity, to kind of pay for or to respond to the bad building practices of the past. So those we you know what the problems are, so we ask me also what, what, what can be done about that, right? So what we tried to do is come up with a proposal that we thought that built on those problems and offered solutions to those four problems that I mentioned. One size doesn't fit all, coordination remains elusive, approval and incentives are insufficient to advance densification, and prioritizing volume over quality is fiscally short-sighted. And what we started thinking about, problem definition must speak to the particularities of the place. The ideas have to generate from the place below up to the in front of me and not down. Second, institutional arrangements have to be flexible to diversify intensification aims. And when I say flexible, maybe not a whole new formal layer of government, metropolitan layer of government, which is a lot of places we can, oh, if only if we had metropolitan governance, we could solve these problems. Well, we will all, it'll be 15 years, I was gonna say we all might be dead, before metropolitan governance as a formal level of governance in Mexico that has decision-making power and money comes to being, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't think about other functional equivalents of thinking at the metro scale, flexible institutions that can be convened and deal with certain problems, which is, I think, what you guys are trying to do with the cluster. Third, the projects can convene or bring coordination more effectively than policy, because you can get different stakeholders together around a real project in a real neighborhood with real investments and green spaces and verticality and commerce and jobs nearby, that it's so much easier to get people to talk together about those concrete ideas and bridge them about how to get that done than to give them some zoning plans and to give them some goal, densification goals and say, do it. So we need to be able to come up, we need to have a platform or event for coming up with projects that bring together people together at the municipal and the metropolitan level. And again, of course, quality and not quantity will generate greater gains. In other words, maybe thinking of slowing down the housing market for a while and focusing on quality housing as opposed to mass production 
I found when I was interviewing developers in Monterey, even they were feeling like it was hurting their business model, all the housing, mass housing production and the abandoned housing, because it meant that they couldn't sell their new houses at the same level as they could have if there hadn't been an excess and oversupply of housing. So it makes sense in the business model to think about creating, at least for the short term, small scale quality housing and not large scale um, massive housing. Um, what we proposed in Thonavit then was what we call, uh, we called it the new strategy called the Urban Value Creation Platform. Again, so I think the, our concept of the platform may not be so different than what you have in mind with the cluster, although I think I want to underscore here that we're talking about urban value creation. It's not even called a housing platform. It's called the urban value creation, how you use housing to create value in the city, value for the homeowner, value for the developer, and value for the metro area. So, and we try to lay out, this is just another rehashing of the points about this urban value creation platform will be a venue for people to define the problems that are peculiar to their particular metropolitan area. It would be an institutional, flexible institution. It would be kind of, a, a, that's why we're calling it a platform, building on in, innovation ideas. It can come and exist for a while, it could disappear, but it, it brings together stakeholders from across the area. It would be unconvening pro discussions about projects, so not just talking about densification, but talking about projects and projects that create value. We even thought about the possibility of, of creating new incentives for investment in projects that we could assess after 10 years creating more value than the developers and even homeowners could get money back. So thinking about incentivizing housing that creates value, not just the final product of housing. And the most important thing is it allowed people in the metro area to think strategically about housing investments. Where, which areas should be developed and should not be developed? Which areas should be mixed land use? Where, which areas are close to schools, hospitals, etc.? Things that if you're just thinking about municipal permitting, developers and the municipal authorities are just looking for the land and the cost of the permit, and they're not really integrating it to kind of larger aims. Um, about creating value in the city over housing. You might ask me, well, why is this, why do we propose this to Infonigate? You could do it, anybody could bring people together on a platform. I think it's really important to remember that Infonigate is a huge source of resources. And that in fact, it combines the resources of workers in Mexico that have been spending years putting money into their pensions. And it doesn't, the amount of, most of the housing that's being built cannot be built without Infonavit, so at least social housing, without some kind of Infonavit subsidy. So Infonavit is an important actor because Infonavit has the money. But Infonavit doesn't have the ideas. Or, Monica, don't tell me what I said that. <laughs> um, well, that's the Infonavit. Infonavit isn't structured to have the ideas, and that's what this platform is about, is how do you make a possibility for new ideas that come not just from Mexico City and the central government, that come from the regions and the places where people know intimately the housing and the urban environments that they live in, and they know what the problems are, and they know what they can and can't do. And they can come up and they have people that want to solve the problems specifically in their city. They don't care about just the number of credits that get passed and to be able to say, we build X number of houses in Mexico, et cetera. They have a different interest. But Infonavit also has an interest to use its money well to create national wealth and patrimony, but at the scale of the city. So I see this platform as kind of combining what I would say the best of the decentralization, the decentralized politics that we're seeing in Mexico with a lot of authority and power and even economic decision making happening at the level of the state, but still connected to the national or the, the federal level because that's where the resources are and it's a, it's a federal it's a federal mandate and an obligation to generate value for workers, their families, and their communities. Um, I'm almost done here. Oh, I was going to tell you, let's see, do I have like 10 more minutes or five more minutes? I just give three examples of projects that we found in the places that we were living, uh, that we were researching, lived there also for a while, um, that, that we found this research before we came up with the idea of the platform, but in a way we started deriving the idea of the platform
from a few instances of coordinating success that we saw in several of the different cities. So the one was the infill, uninfill project in Jalisco. Now I mentioned earlier that I think that Guadalajara is quickly becoming a basket case if you look at the entire metro area. But that doesn't mean that different municipalities aren't doing some really great things. And in the municipality of Guadalajara, which is the oldest, already the most dense, but also very little open land, that they, there are very few lots to be able to build vertical housing, but there was a coordinated effort with a, the Instituto Municipality de Vienda, the Municipality of Guadalajara, the Public Works Office, as well as Cana Davy and the Water Agency to meet as a weekly task force to be able to push forward this project. Now, this is not necessarily a huge project. It's not going to, you know, make lots, it's not going to build, build lots and lots of housing, but it's going to lay a model or infill, how it's feasible fiscally as, as well as socially and politically to start pushing towards infill. You need some demonstration projects. The second one was the streamlined permitting in, in Tijuana. So again, I mentioned that people, there's a kind of collective consciousness that the permitting process is really tough, but also that uh, permitting has involves negotiations about who pays for, for resources again, water, uh, electricity, roads, etc. And then some of the barriers was getting all the act, the main barrier was getting all the actors together to agree on that through the process of permitting. And they have used some data that now in front of me has done a great job in starting to collect national data about housing and about housing building to be able to customize a digital platform for Tijuana and then allow them to expedite the management of paper. And that was a combination of actors involved. It wasn't one actor saying, we've got to change how we do paperwork. work. And then the last one is in Aguas Calientes, which I do think is an ex There are historical reasons why Aguas Calientes has been so successful, in addition to the strong relationships, a single municipality with a strong relationship with the state. But the, the interesting thing for us in the Aguas Calientes case was that they faced the problem of affordable land scarcity within the central well service areas where they wanted to densify. And what they ended up doing was a very interesting um, kind of scoping out of possible open land with federal government um, support, and in front of you was involved in this, is they bought up state-owned land that was under electric power lines, so it was national patrimony. So they did a lot of scoping out in the city of what lands were available for state purchase and then the state could direct with the private developers the construction of a new, more dense area. So it, it took some kind of research reconnaissance to be able to identify the best places in the city where there's available land. In this case, I think it's important to understand that the state can be your partner because land that the state owns is easy, more easily, often more easily turned over to public purposes than other state land that's owned by the private sector. So that was Aguas Calientes. So this is, I, I promise, two more slides. I, I, we also have had an idea that, that uh, we, we promoted it with a platform, um, and that is the notion of defensible urbanism. Because we found in our research that the idea of densification, or even verticalization, is very complicated and not accepted everywhere. And in some cities, verticalization is more feasible than others. And in some cities, densification is more feasible than others. So what we coined the concept of defensible urbanism. In other words, which decisions, which combination of, of location and height and other sets of things, maybe it's just a matter of location near other major infrastructure, transport, and public services that creates better urbanism. It's not just simply higher or in the center of the city. There are many ways that we can think about defensible urbanism. At the GSD, our school, whole school is thinking about, you know, from the scale of the house to the scale of the street to the scale of the neighborhood to the scale of the metro area. We even have people who work on kind of the regional scale. You have to be able to understand what is, how you create, when I say defensible urbanism that's sustainable, that creates a positive quality of life socially, spatially, fiscally, and that contributes to the environmental sustainability. And there are many ways that you can create defensible urban
urbanism, but you have to be focusing on defensible urbanism, not on the house alone. Um, the other thing that we, we suggested in the, um, for the platform is that sometimes there will be convening and people will talk and they won't agree. Sometimes in a platform where you're coming up with strategic ideas about, about you know, changing the model of your city, you're going to have conflict and contention, but the mere process of bringing stakeholders together to explain what they see as defensible urban, what they need, maybe they don't need a certain uh, type of a house, maybe they need more green space and they need more, more HR space. These are questions that can be discussed in a platform, so it has a process play a process role to get people together to talk collectively about the urban future in their city, but it also should have an outcome role, maybe to agree on several projects, target maybe acupuncture, strategically placed projects that start contributing to defensible urbanism. Um, I, will, I will spare you the organogram here, but it really talks about the way that in Florida, we see in Florida as a central convener for these conversations, because InfoDB has a lot of experience, InfoDB knows what's happening in other cities, InfoDB has resources, InfoDB should be involved in the discussion, but InfoDB is a convener for local, local actors to be coming up with solutions, then to send them back to InfoDB. Um, and then finally, I, I'll stop here, this, this is a little into my planning oriented um, background, but to remember the, the kind of larger principles about the process and the outcome when you're thinking about principles of everybody, all stakeholders should be involved. So not just the municipality, political leaders and the developers, citizens, universities, College of Engineering, uh, NGOs, people who care about what's happening in the city. So process becomes important. You want everybody to have access to the conversation want to be able to think about how different projects integrate and make the whole of the city greater than the sum of its parts. You want to be able to activate more positive land use through your projects, and you want to be thinking always about the collective urban good, however you might define that. Thank you. Si sí, hay algunas preguntas para nuestra conferencista, con gusto es el momento. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Uh, excellent presentation. I would like to add that uh, maybe part of the solution that you asked at the beginning has to do with to let the people change houses. If they have a credit for 20 years, it may be will be, in many cases, the only credit that they will have. And if they hold that credit because the house is not in the location close to their work, they will default and they will not have another credit. But that people is moving to somewhere. So maybe if the economic regulation allows to change the house, to change the credit to a different house closer for the different needs that is going to work to make an effort to have that kind of facilities to make the industry come to that places. Then those abandoned houses maybe will begin to have people that work in that part that begins. That's the idea. That's a, that's a great comment. I don't want to do as more about what's happening in Fundy, but I do know they are, are, they are discussing now possibility of being able to have that credit be mobile. In other words, if you move, you take a job in another city, you should be able to take your credit with you. So I think, and I think that's an important general policy that could be used or introduced at the national level. It's also important to remember, though, that uh, if they've already abandoned their house, they've lost all that capital that they put into that. So that's why it's important to be to kind of be proactive and think about that before they just leave the house already, because then it's going to be hard for them to go back 
and they, they've lost money. Everybody's lost money with that. But it's also, and I'm not working on that project, but I know there are plenty of teams of people in front of me working on what to do with abandoned housing. Maybe re recast them or resell them. Maybe there's a way to generate revenue from that. that 